Uh, our project's on Xanthomonas, which is probably one of the most pervasive uh, bacterial phytopathogens in the world. It affects nearly every type of crop, and it causes significant losses in economically important crops, including wheat, rice, maize, brassicas, which is a major focus of our work, banana, pepper, citrus, major problem in Florida at the moment, and cotton. Uh, so as I said, a big component of our project looks at Xanthomonas campestris, Pathovar campestris, which causes black rot. And some people are probably happy that their Brussels sprouts aren't coming to market. But I want to, first of all, give you an example of uh, what can happen with a Xanthomonas disease if you don't pay attention to it. So this is a multidisciplinary project with Exeter, Thera and Warwick involved. And so I want to give you an example of bananas. And particularly, there's a number of diseases of bananas. There's one incredibly important disease which affects uh, banana production in Africa. So why should we care about this? And I was, I was laughing at Ian's talk because I'm claiming banana is the fourth most important staple crop in the world. And like the potatoes, China and India are the biggest producers of bananas in the world. But the beauty about bananas is it's got diverse uses. It's got present all year round and for example the average Ugandan will consume over 300 kilograms of bananas per year but not if they look like this so this is banana xanthomonas wilt disease and it's present in many areas in Africa and this is an old slide hasn't been updated but effectively it's constrained banana production in Uganda and Kenya and the governments there have allowed genetic modification of bananas, although that got retracted in Kenya, simply because of this one disease. But I want to take you back to another plant called Enceti. Enceti ventricosum, which is false banana. Some of you might have these in, in your house. It doesn't produce banana fruit, but you can see on the panel there the devastating effect this disease can have. It's the largest herb in the world. And, and the Ethiopians eat this, so it's orphan to Ethiopian. They eat the corm of the plant. And there's been a lot of work trying to manage this disease. And obviously, it's a lot of hygiene and cleaning machetes. We started working on this about 10 years ago. And what we've been able to do, these are massive plants. We took them down to the uh, hospital before the waiting list was so long and did an MRI scan. So we can actually look at the disease progression and the, these are the basal stems. So these are pseudostems, they're not trunks. And we can actually see the bacteria accumulate in the vasculature of those stems. And this is the example I want to give. So Bradbury was a, a botanist at Kew, a plant pathologist. And in 74, said great care should be taken to see that insect wilt does not escape Ethiopia and establish itself on other plants. And this is where we saw a massive host jump from Enceti to banana. And my colleague, David Studham Dexter, and myself, when I was down there, we were looking at this. So basically, we had in 68, it got out of Uganda, is identified, sorry, Ethiopia, identified in Uganda in 2001. And it subsequently spread around those parts of Africa. So around East Africa. And we've been able to use genomics to map the spread of this and we're able to show there's been two outbreaks, specific independent outbreaks, simply by doing whole genome sequencing. And I just want to use that to reinforce the importance of genomics in any sort of biosecurity work that we're doing. So how can pathogen genomics help improve food and biosecurity? And well, you can use it to get a better understanding of host range and adaptation and movement of the pathogen and climate change identify unknown hosts, unravel host jumps like this one from inset to banana, and then develop diagnostics. And those diagnostics can be for biosecurity screening, in-field screening for industry, or screening for the phytosanitary regulatory processes. And so very quickly, this is simply an example of the different applications you can use genomics for, looking at the evolution of the pathogen, looking at taxonomy, reclassifying the pathogens. And what a lot of people are interested in, molecular detection and diagnostics. And we, we did this and developed a LAMPS assay for bananas anthemonas well a number of years ago in collaboration with FERA. 
So I'm having problems shifting. Okay. So what about the UK? So what we have in the UK, as I mentioned, is Xanthomonas campestris, campestris, a problem that's here. We also have other Xanthomonas. So Xanthomonas campestris, pathovar pathina, raffini and radish and brassicas, and in carne, which is on ornamentals, and that's the wallflower here. But we also have massive threats which are not present in the UK and Europe yet. And so in FERA, they're, they're looking at these at the moment and doing pest risk analysis on them. And the major one, I suppose, is, is Xanthomonas vasicola pathovar vasculorum, which is bacterial leaf streaker maze. It's currently absent in the UK. Similarly, Xanthomonas on strawberries. So strawberries, particularly up in Scotland, uh, we're, one of, we're producing at least 30 to 40% of our own strawberries now. And another one, probably not considered so important. So watercress pathogen, Xanthomonas. So those are the ones which we're focusing upon on the project. And bacterial leaf streak and maize, why is it important in the UK? Well, maize production has increased 300% in the UK over the last 15 to 20 years. And part of that is driven by biofuels and, and using it as a different feed. But what we've found out while we're doing the study is also that the UK has a massive variety of different maize seed that's used. So different maize varieties, and we need to test those, and that's what Farah is doing at the moment. So they're developing this pest risk analysis. And what we're trying to do is test the maize varieties which have been used in UK agriculture. And it's predominantly all in England, simply because of the climate, the nature of the climate there. So it's warmer. And currently we've tested and we're selecting these races using PCR, qPCR, and doing glasshouse pathotesting with the pathogen. The other one is strawberry production. This has what we call an EPPO A2 list status. So it's a regulated non-quarantine pest in the EU and UK. It's present across a number of countries, including New Zealand, USA, and it's actually been found in some European countries. It's predominantly spread by movement of strawberry transplants, and usually these are asymptomatic. So FERA is looking at pathogenicity of this and developing molecular tests, which can be rapidly deployed. And there's a question to consider whether this needs to be a quarantine pathogen. Uh, the other part of the project, which isn't so relevant to security, but is highly relevant to pathogens which are present, is developing resistance against them. And this is particularly important for XCC. And what we're showing here is a lot of work that's done by a postdoc in the project, Shannon Greer, who's been tested a lot of resistant and susceptible lines, both in leafy brassica, brassica oleracea, and brassica napis. And I'm just giving you an example of this. We've developed tools in the project to visualize the pathogens. So here, the, the uh, bioluminescence you see here is actually from the bacteria themselves, and we can cross a susceptible to a resistance line. So why do we want to do this? Well, brassica production in the UK is over, over 400,000 tonnes per year, 25,000 hectares, and more than 200 million pounds in value. Or... 25% of the total field vegetable value. And superimposed upon top of that is this huge nutritional value within the brassicaceae. And so very quickly, the way this is done is to generate what we call F1s and then back cross these to susceptible resistance lines. So these are your back crosses or develop F2 lines from there. And what we're trying to do in the project is to characterize the resistance so that we can feed this across to breeding companies who want to breed resistance. And there's two important races, race one and race four in the UK. Okay, so how do we protect our borders? So we can do, so the examples I've given you today are the Brassicaceae from Campestris Campestris, and we can use genomics to do pathogenicity, the race typing work that's going on here at Warwick. Strawberry, so we can search for, Apologies, this keeps on. Search for pathogen species, cultivar races, develop assays, PCR, quantitative PCR or lamp-based assays, 
and the same for maize. And what we're looking at is early detection so we can develop strategies to avoid the introduction of these key pathogen threats to the UK. And so one way we can do this, and I just want to share with you something which has just been released today, and this is something called Phytobac Explorer. And this is a database. Currently, it contains only Xanthomonas, so there's nearly 2,000 bacterial strains, and people can go in there and explore and upload their sequencing data, look at metagenomics data. They can use it. You don't need to put data in there. It's available, and you can also put your own personal data in there, and it can be submitted privately for at least 12 months, but you can do searching the other databases and the other isolates in there. So at the moment, it's just Xanthomonas. It's going to have Pseudomonas and Ralstonia in the next couple of months. It's been developed by Sasha Ott, who's been leading it at Warwick, and Dave Studdenham and Laura Baxter. Laura's at Warwick here, and she's she's been a key driver in, the, in developing the whole back end of this. It was developed some th something called Enterobase, which got developed in Warwick a few years ago. There's one-to-one -one training available for those who want to explore it. You can upload your own data. You can sequence your unknown. You can upload the data and have a play with the system to see if you can identify what they are. Brilliant graphics and other functionality in the system. It's updated every day on NCBI. And effectively, the uses of this are unlimited. So you can use it for frontier discovery. You can use it for identification of the unknown evolution, taxonomy, and what's probably interesting to a lot of people on, on this meeting is diagnostics. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for your attention.